welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. We're in the workshop today because we're actually going to do some serious experimentation. Last time we were really trying to investigate the science behind how titanium oxide turns black. And I think we managed to establish that uh, it wasn't a chemical reaction, it was a change of crystal structure that reflected the light or did not reflect the light. And I bought some white tiles and some titanium dioxide which I tried to apply in various ways last time very crudely with a brush um, using a, isopropyl, a small amount of isopropyl alcohol to turn it into a creamy mixture. I quickly realised that the variation in the surface texture was going to absorb the light energy in different ways and produce different net results. One of the techniques I tried was to mix up a suspension in water and tried applying it with a just an ordinary plant spray bottle. The idea was very simple and logical. The suspended particles sitting in this lovely smooth fluid film would drop down onto the surface and produce an even layer of sediment on the surface. And as the water dried off, so I would be left with this lovely even coating. For the sediment has actually migrated away because of the surface tension on the glaze underneath. Now I did try several things to try and reduce that surface tension like very very fine 600 grit wet and dry paper and various things like that. Water suspension is not a viable solution. While I was carrying out this vital part of the process, getting a nice even layer onto the tile, um, I had some fairly serious communications with somebody that was obviously very, very knowledgeable about this process. And I'm pretty suspicious that it was Nicky himself who was giving me some very good advice about how to get an even layer of material onto the surface. A few days later, somebody else backed up the same idea. And so consequently, I've listened to that good advice and I've bought myself an airbrush. Not something I've ever used before. Very conveniently marked this little bottle here with three marks. One third of it has been filled up with the titanium dioxide and I'm now going to fill it up to probably two thirds full. That's my starting mixture. Who knows whether or not it's the right mix. So we just give that a jolly good mix to try and break down all the particles into very fine suspension. And we'll clean two or three tiles with some acetone make sure we've got that nicely suspended with a final shake and I'll just bring you down to my eye view so that you can see across the light hold it up to the light very carefully I can still see that there's some sections there where the glaze is still showing through. So I've now changed the mix to one part titanium dioxide and three parts isopropyl alcohol to make it a thinner mix. <laughs> Just turn it up to the light to see what's going on. You can see the shiny glaze through the thin sections where I haven't covered it quite sufficiently. Look, just two or three minutes and you can see how quickly this is sedimented out. There's the clear liquid and it's still busy settling down. But to be honest, the really interesting and major part of this exercise has been trying to decode how we turn white titanium dioxide black. And that all comes down to heat changing the crystal structure. So I feel very confident about that. And from the quick tests that I did on my tile, little teeny weeny bit of tile, I know that it's going to make a black mark, but it had a little black mark in the middle. And then around the outside of that black mark, we had a melt pool of glaze. To do photo engraving, what I call proper photo engraving, requires precision dots. And I'm not sure that I'm going to get precision dots off the CO2. I've never seen any physical work from the diode laser. I've seen photographs of pictures that look pretty good, but I don't know exactly how good they are. Now I understand that most people that are using diode lasers 
use a an image conversion program a free or low cost called Imager, I think is Imager. I'm extremely happy that Nicky discovered this process. And if it was him, I can only thank him for advising me to use an airbrush because I think that has solved my application problem. Now, as I mentioned earlier, three people in particular have asked me about upgrading to a CO2 laser and whether or not the Nicky Norton white tile method works on a CO2 laser. I'm not in a position to fully answer that yet. I know that it works because I've seen other people's work, but I'm not sure it's what I call proper photo engraving. And I think we need to go into that subject for those people that are transferring from a diode laser to a CO2 laser. There are significant differences between these two machines. The biggest difference is the wavelength of the light. And that means that the near UV wavelength light is going to be very easily accepted by the titanium dioxide and it's going to heat up very efficiently and very quickly. Now, although the CO2 laser will heat up titanium dioxide, it'll do it much less efficiently. It'll do it slower and because it's got a bigger beam, it's likely to do it in a cruder manner. The normal CO2 laser that most people have is a continuous wave system. In other words, it's constant current you turn the power on and it stays on. That's not the case with the diode laser because the diode laser is PWM controlled, which basically means it's a pulsed lacing signal. So there's another reason why the heating effect, which is what we're relying upon for this white to black conversion, could be different. Now this might be less efficient at heating the titanium dioxide, but I've got substantially more power on this machine. But is that going to help us? I can't predict it. We're now going to nip into the office for five minutes and I'm going to explain the basics of graphics and converting a photo for engraving. So anybody that's jumping up to one of these machines from a diode laser has probably become used to what I call substandard photo engraving. Now I need to justify that, so let's go and look in the office and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, now I'd like you to join me with a bit of an examination of this image that's on the screen. Question one, what is it? I don't mean young female savage, I mean, is it a drawing? Is it a painting? Is it a photograph? Well, I don't think anybody will ever mistake that for a photograph, an artistic impression of some sort. I mean, just take a look here. What's this? Is this hair or is this straw? Let's have a quick look here. What are all these marks here? Is this a sign of a very old lady with wrinkles on her skin? Could be because look at these lips. Those are the lips of a 70-year-old. But that face is the face of a 20, 25-year-old young lady who's had a bad makeup day. Is this war paint? Or is this actually cut in scars? These look very much as though they're deep scars in her cheek. These are just a few of the minor details I'm pointing out to you on this picture. If an artist had drawn this, he wouldn't have put these wrinkles in here because those wrinkles don't belong there. They're not even shadows of these pieces of hay, straw, hair, call it whatever you like. Okay, look at this bright white line down here. Where does that come from? Has she got some sort of light behind her chin? Everything about this picture says there's something wrong. And it is a very, very nice photograph. And you can clearly see that it is a 22, 25 year old young lady that's got beautiful hair. She hasn't really got deeply cut wrinkles in her lips. She hasn't even got scars on her face. Look at those moody eyes. They're not the same starey eyes that you're seeing here. So what's the difference between these two? How has that photograph been so badly distorted into this cartoon, pencil sketch, 
I don't know how to describe it. Now this is a sort of photo preparation work that's carried out by, let's call them the big boys. There are a couple of pieces of commercial software that you can buy. Uh, I think one is called OneTouch and the other thing is called Photograv. They belong to the large companies that are selling RF laser machines. Now, as I commented to you a little bit earlier, the RF laser machine that I've got is absolutely rubbish at producing photo quality engraving. And so consequently, to overcome the problem of not being able to produce photo quality engraving, they produce distorted images that take into account the weaknesses of the photo engraving process that they can carry out on these machines. Now, this is not from one of those two big companies. This is an example from the software that probably you guys are using. It's called Imager. Look how light this is in relation to the original. And look how little gray there is in here. It's been stripped of most of its shades. It's been sharpened to death to turn her hair into straw. Yes, they're similar. They're the same, but they're not the same. Now what I want to do is to describe to you why this has arrived from that. You are not going to produce this when you put your image that's been prepared for laser engraving down onto a piece of material. You will get something like this. You will not get anything like this. Now, to me, that is not photo engraving. And I hope I'm going to be able to demonstrate to you with this technique that Nikki has developed of black dots on a white tile, something I've been trying to achieve for a long time since the few laser tiles that I managed to acquire slipped through my fingers. When I had those laser tiles, I was getting close to this sort of quality on a laser tile. So what I'm hoping is that the process that Nikki has afforded me will allow me to show you how good a quality you can achieve with a CO2 laser. You will not be able to achieve this quality I'm afraid with a diode laser or with an RF laser because there is a fundamental problem that exists that prevents you from doing so. I'm not saying that the pictures that you produce on a diode laser or an RF laser are crap. Far from it. They're very acceptable but they are not photo quality on the basis of how I describe photo quality. So I'm going to define that for you and show you exactly why you can't achieve it on a diode laser or an RF laser. Now, let's forget this picture for a moment and let's go back to this original photograph. This is not a particularly high resolution image. Let's just have a look to see what it is. It looks pretty good. So here we are. It's 52 pixels per inch. Pretty low resolution. And then its height is 400 millimetres and it's 1.2 metres wide. So it's a huge photograph with very few pixels in it. They're big pixels. So we can change this to something that we would like to produce. Now, when I say we would like to produce, you can imagine making small dots, but in reality, you have to make small dots with your laser machine. Otherwise you won't be able to do photo engraving that matches your imagination. Pretty good resolution is a 0.1 dot. And a 0.1 dot is 254. In this case, because they're on the screen, they are pixels per inch. PPI, 254 PPI. It doesn't look as though anything's changed. But we can go back and we can just check three inches, three and a half inches tall and about because the other picture is sitting over here, it's about 10 inches wide. 
Okay, but it's now changed to 254 pixels per inch. Now, if we zoom in on, let's just say, her eye, you can see the pixels there. You can also see all this shading of greys from black all the way through to white. Now, this is something called a grey scale image. There are 254 shades of grey in that picture, plus white and black. You mix white, which is actually code 255, and black, which is code 0, and between those two, the ratio of mixing black and white gives you various shades of grey. So that's how the grayscale comes about. We have got a laser machine. I've got a white tile and I've got white paint. Now hopefully when I fire, I use that word in inverted commas, the white paint, it's going to turn black. So we're going to finish up with a picture that has to be two colours. It's a binary image, black and white. So we cannot produce what we see here on this screen, all those shades of grey, but we're going to. We're going to do a trick. We're going to fool the eye, and the eye is very easily fooled. We're going to change this into something called a bitmap. It says the picture here is 254 pixels per inch, and it gives us the opportunity of dithering using a method called diffusion dither. Now, if you've never come across dithering before, you'll see what it is in a minute. There are, there are various choices here in Photoshop for different sorts of dithers. Stick with the diffusion dither, because for laser work, this is the best. This diffusion dither makes a very good job of sorting out all these very, very fine, pale shades. There are all these other algorithms that you can come across as well for dithering, things like Jarvis, Atkins, Stuckey, and uh, Newsprint. But this particular algorithm here, called Diffusion Dither, in Photoshop, is based on a very, very powerful algorithm called Floyd Steinberg. Let's just do it. There we go. We've done it. We've now turned that picture into a binary image. This picture is stored in memory and the software scans across backwards and forwards and as it scans across backwards and forwards it reads these dots like Morse code. So let's just take a look just here. We've got a line of about four or five pixels, then we've got a gap of two, then we've got a single pixel, gap of two, single pixel, gap of two, single pixel, and so it runs across here. And then look here we've got black pixel, white pixel, black pixel, white pixel. To help us set the machine, if you can reproduce this pattern, which is 254 PPI pattern, and this is the pattern that I use for calibrating and setting my machine. If you can achieve this pattern cleanly and clearly, then you have the capability of copying these individual pixels on here, which are point one. So photo replication is exact copy of these pixels. If the dot that you produce is bigger than these pixels, then mm, the ratio of black and white in this image will change. And the picture will get darker because the dots are bigger and the amount of white in the picture becomes less and your eye will see it as a darker picture. That's the basic principle, as I said, of how dithering works to fool your eye. You saw me use this pattern in the last video when I was trying to establish the correct power and speed to run at. So having carried out this pattern already, I know that I can get pretty good dots on the CO2 laser machine, which gives me a great deal of hope that I shall be able to achieve reasonable quality photo replication. Remember what the rule of photo replication is? One pixel must be copied by one dot, the same size dot as the pixel. Pixels do not overlap, therefore dots must not overlap. There's only two colours in that picture, black and white. 
you have got control of the black and indirectly you will control the white by going smaller or larger with your black. So it's important that you control the size of the black dot that you're going to put down. If you can copy every black dot then you will replicate that picture without any need for, for this distortion software. The only thing that you need is a good dithering algorithm. And as I said, Floyd Steinberg is it. Okay, so here we've got that row of pixels. And now what we're going to do, we're going to use the diode or the RF laser, which has the ability to switch on instantly. There is no delay to switch on or switch off because the beam in both of those cases is controlled electronically. It may be a few nanoseconds, it may be a few microseconds, but in real terms, it's instant. So here's what's going to happen. The head is going to come along and the software is going to say, OK, switch the beam on now because it's come across a black edge. And so what it'll do, it'll switch the beam on now. There's the beam. And then it'll traverse across the pixel and it gets to the white edge and it runs out of black and it says, OK, turn it off now. So it turns the beam off. It then traverses across to the next pixel where it says, OK, turn the beam on. And then it travels across the pixel and says, turn the beam off. I think you're getting the idea now, aren't you? We're going to travel across here like this. And as we travel across here, we get to that one and we get to that one. It's going to be half a dot overhang on every pixel. So we are never going to see white gaps between single black pixels. And that's going to make the image dark because we're going to destroy the ratio of white to black if we get white pixels and black pixels very close together. Where we've got a long string of pixels like this, the effect will be a lot less because you've only got one at each end which is causing the visual distortion of grey. Now we can see in this picture how many single pixels we've got. They're all over the place because those are the things that are providing gentle shades of grey. So let's go and have a look at the other image which has been sitting over there quietly beside us and now we can look at that image and we can see hang on we've got virtually no black pixels on there and if we had overlap at the end of each one of those pixels there is so much white in there that it would do virtually no damage to the ratio of black and white and that's the essence of why these pictures are so distorted. You're trying to remove the single pixels away and you'll notice a lot of these pixels in here are all joined up black pixels. There's not many single pixels. There are some single pixels in here, but you know they will have to just come in and get slightly darker. So the whole picture has been lightened so that it allows for these picture, pixels to make the picture darker in places. It's a trick that's used to try and make the image look more like the original, but it never will be a photo replication. It will always be a distorted image. So I hope I've convinced you of what true photo replication is. And that's what we're going to achieve with this wonderful method that Nicky Norton has devised. If I can produce a pattern of single controllable black pixels, the right size, I don't need any of this distortion software. I can yes, just use the original picture and copy it. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. Now with a CO2 laser, you don't have the same sort of problem because the CO2 laser is actually quite a slow and lazy machine. Because of the ionization that has to occur in the tube before you can get any power out of your machine, it's 
determined by the rise time of the high voltage that determines how quickly the ionized beam can form. At that point there when you switch on it takes time to switch the beam on then it switches off and then it takes time again to switch the beam on. So at this point here we've only got a small proportion of the pixel which has actually got enough power to produce a burn. And so we can actually get dots with a continuous power glass tube laser which you cannot get with an RF tube or a diode laser. Now I'll show you that under the microscope later but it isn't even quite as simple as that because as we drive the head along you'll see that the dots are not quite round they tend to be more or less tear shaped a bit like that because as you drive along we're still getting an increase of power before we get to this peak of doing maximum damage. So we tend to get a teardrop shape which tells us which way the laser beam is actually running. What I've produced so far has been something like that. That's the sort of picture I've been getting when I've been doing these little dot tests down here. So there's the image that I'm going to try and reproduce because it tells me a great deal about the dot quality that I'm going to be able to achieve. As you can see this is a uh, this is a dithered pattern 254 dots per inch but the sort of things that we're looking for in the end result are the resolution of the nostrils and the colour in the eyes. Okay I'm very confident I should be able to pick up all these hairs that are on here that's not a problem and these whiskers they'll come out but it's really the density of the blacks that's more important whether we can pick up these different density of blacks. You'll see that it's got a lot of black in it and not much white and here you've got just a few whites so if these blacks dots are too big they will merge into each other and they will if you like swamp the white that's supposed to be in there so it's most important that what I'm doing with this image is to produce one dot equals one pixel and the pixels are 0.1 square so I'm looking to produce a 0.1 round dot to get as close as I can to this picture and that's the aim of photo engraving as far as I'm concerned one dot equals one pixel. Now I've set the power quite high at 40 percent which is about 30 35 watts but I'm running at 400 millimeters a second so the exposure time for each dot is very small. Well there's the final result before I wash any of the uh, titanium dioxide off. I'm pretty pleased with that to be honest. Um, it's, it's got all the features that I was looking for remember I wanted to see the colour in the eyes and I wanted to see the nostrils and the colour in the nostrils. I mean the definition on here is absolutely amazing. Now look I'm not afraid to tell you that I made a mistake to start with. I got the settings wrong and in fact what I had to do you may just be able to see it over the corner there where my finger is. I had to do a couple of little uh, dot tests to get the power right. 30% power and 200 millimetres a second. And it took 32 minutes to do that image, that size. So that's A4 size almost. I'm absolutely amazed at the quality and definition that I've been able to get. Now here I was seeing that I was not getting the right amount of penetration. Look you can see here the whisker, it just wasn't making it down here at all. I hadn't got enough power. Now what I haven't done at the moment is I haven't looked at that to see whether or not I've got my pixel to dot ratio one to one. It looks pretty good but we'll only know what this looks like when we look at it under the microscope. This is what I call photo engraving. I'm copying every pixel that's in the picture. Well let me just go and wash that off. I don't think it's going to look any different at all to be honest. Okay, so here's what it's like when the titanium dioxide has been washed off. Literally it was just washed off under water. 
no solvent or anything required and let's just zoom in and have a bit of a look at the detail that we've managed to get on this picture. Remember I was worried about the eyes? They've come out extremely well. Look, we've managed to get all those hair details in the ear. And all those very minute hairs down the side of the face. Those lovely whiskers. And I have to say that, to be honest, it's probably one of the best versions of that picture I've ever managed to create. So, I can only thank Nicky Knowlton for discovering this process, be it accidental or, or whatever, um, because not the same as laser tile and in fact I think it's better than laser tile because the laser tile was having an effect underneath the glaze this is not under the glaze it's just it's sitting on top of the glaze and gives a much better contrast so on balance I think this is a, a much better process after my first set of tests last time when we saw that I was able to produce frog spawn because the titanium dark side melts at about 1800 degrees C and yet round the outside of the frog spawn we had got the glaze that was melting which probably melts at 12 to 1400 degrees C so we got a puddle of melt around a black line or a black center and I was worried that that was going to create totally the wrong ratio of black and white in this picture because we need a black pixel to be replaced by a black dot if we get a black pixel replaced by a sort of a half black dot then the ratio of black to white in this image starts to change and your eye doesn't see it as a shade of grey it sees it as a lighter shade of grey than, than the dithered image should be but because this is so good in terms of replicating the original image it looks as though we've managed to get the pixels and the dots matching. Now although these dots are exactly like those that I produced during my test it's amazing that they come out as well as they do. We know that the relationship between these is 0.1 so using that as a scaling reference we can see that that dot there is about 0.1. The melt zone is more than 0.1. The dot is less than 0.1. And these dots are less than 0.1 as well, wide. Because if they were 0.1, they would touch each other. I don't know how the colour of this glaze affects the final presentation. The glaze is approximately 0.1 but the dots in the centre are roughly 0.05 as you can see. So does that mean to say possibly I could force this picture to something like about a 508 resolution, 500 dots per inch? That's an interesting possibility that I might explore in another session. These little blobs of glaze that have melted around the titanium dioxide are rather interesting. I don't know whether they're going to act like little magnifying glasses and somehow spread the black dot out for our visual observation or whether actually we actually don't see anything other than these little black lines when we observe it from distance. The interesting question is what has happened to these black blobs? So let's just zoom in. We're going to take a look at this single pixel here at 400 magnification and see just what's happened to the glass, the surface of the tile, and the titanium dioxide. So I'm going to lower the table on this microscope, and we can see that the background here has gone out of focus. Now, as I raise the table up, the high spot, wherever the high spot is, is going to start coming into focus. And we've got some high spots just here. They're on the edge of the glaze melt. Here we're starting to get the titanium dioxide coming into focus as well. 
So we've got the edge of the melt and the titanium dark side roughly on the same plane. We're just coming into focus with the tile itself. This melt has raised by roughly two or three microns above the surface of the tile. This black blob that we've created has sunk into the molten glass or the molten glaze material. Okay, and it's sitting virtually level with the surface of the tile. But it is interesting to note that right round the outside of all of these, look, we've got a little encrustation of titanium dioxide, the white titanium dioxide. It could well be that that is actually never going to come off because it's somehow just in a transition phase where it's starting to clump together, but it hasn't yet had enough temperature to turn it black. Now this has been a very very interesting session for me because despite the fact that I said earlier on that my main interest in this subject was trying to decode how the titanium oxide turns black. Now that it has turned black and I've seen the results it's absolutely fascinating. I'm interested in the science and the technology or methodology of how we get to a quality picture like this. Now this is the best quality picture that I've ever produced um, because of the great contrast between the white background and the black dots. This is coming close to the process that we've all hijacked from the print industry. This dithering technique was never intended for laser machines, but it just so happens that now we have the ability to produce precision black dots on a superb white background we're back to exactly what the print industry designed this technology for. Well, I've demonstrated to you clearly that you don't need any preparation or distortion software to get a good result. But that's exactly what these sessions are all about. We're getting under the hood. We're understanding the details behind this very complex technology. So thanks for your time and your patience listening to all my technical ramblings. I shall catch up with you in the next session. Bye for now.